So I have here an original stumpage receipt from 1920. Now stumpage, if you didn't know, is the technical term for the payment to a landowner for the right to harvest timber. So essentially it is the landowner's share of a timber harvest. But there's something very special about this particular stumpage receipt other than the fact that it's over 100 years old. And that is that this was paid by my great grandfather, William Lowry in Monticello, Maine. Now, that means that he was the logger on this particular job. Now, he was quite the record keeper, and I'm very fortunate that he left my family with his journal, which was written from a period between 1914 and the mid-20s. And in it, he was, he was primarily a potato farmer, and that was his primary occupation. Like many farmers of those days, he dabbled in wood harvesting during the winter when you couldn't exactly grow potatoes. Um, but nonetheless, his passion in life remained farming and potatoes. And so he noted the price of potatoes about every other day. And what's really cool about this particular journal is it's a great documentation of the economic history of the early 20th century. You can see both the recession of 1914, which was brought about by the beginning of World War I, and also the depression, yes, depression of 1920, that was a thing, um, through the price of potatoes. You know, it, at the end of World War I, the price of potatoes was very high as inflation rose, and then you saw them take a plummet during the depression of 1920. It's a very fascinating artifact and um, a very unique thing that I have in my family. Unfortunately, due to his preoccupation with potatoes, uh, he did not note the prices of wood too much. So this document is actually the sole document I have that has any sort of hard economic data about the forest industry from that time period. Nonetheless, he did have a lot of uh, descriptions of the community and economy of that time from his hunting trips and the people and lumberjacks he met in his lifetime. So with this and combined with his writings, I have a pretty good picture of what the forest economy looked 100 years ago in northern Maine. And I thought what might be a really cool thing to do is to look at this and see how exactly the forest economy has changed over the last century and whether or not these prices have actually fared well against inflation. Both inflation and stumpage are pretty tricky metrics and they present some pretty unique challenges. Inflation has its own whole set of issues, which I'll leave to economists, but stumpage is just something else altogether. It's gonna depend on the uh, terrain and the land itself. It's gonna depend on the species and products. You know, especially back then, transportation costs were extremely high, so it was highly dependent on the local community. Nonetheless, I think this has a very important lesson as to the overall trajectory of the forest economy and maybe the real source of complaints that some of us might have. So all that having been said, let's take a look. So once again, this is a stumpage receipt and this is the amount the logger, which would be my great grandfather, paid to the landowner, which in this case would be Madigan and Pierce, which I tried to find some information on online, but uh, it must have been a little too small of a company to make it onto online archive. So maybe this summer I'll go to the Registry of Deeds and look for that a little more. But anyway, um, and here what we have is we have a list of products that were cut and scaled. And as you can see, this is part of the reason why it's so limited, uh, is we have pine, cedar, hemlock, and fir all blank. And then we have railroad ties, which is actually interesting that that's a product uh, because the railroad was being built at this time. So that tells us a little something about the local economy. And then down here, we have an area for uh, peeled cords of pulpwood. But that's crossed out and we just have cords and then hardwood. And we have 25 and a half cords sold at a rate, or bought at a rate rather, of $2 with a scaling fee of $2.55. So it was a pretty small and particular harvest. But like I said, my great grandfather was a potato farmer. This was just something he did, not even necessarily for money during the winters, but just to pass his time as far as I can tell. Unfortunately, I am left with a little bit of forensics to do because hardwood isn't actually a product. Hardwood is a classification of species. It could refer to a couple different things. Now, for most of Northern Maine during this time period, there wasn't much of a market for hardwood saw timber. There wasn't a hardwood lumber mill. But for Monticello, Maine, based on my great grandfather's journal entries and descriptions of hunting trips, he does mention a hardwood mill in the area. But he sold this uh, in cords, and that would have been very strange for saw timber even back then. Additionally, most of the hardwood lumber during that era was sugar maple, and I know from his journal entries during the days he was actually uh, harvesting this lot that he was cutting birch. He doesn't specify whether it was white birch or yellow birch, but it was birch. 
So I think it's reasonable to assume that this was for firewood because of course we have to remember how important of a resource firewood was back then, especially for a colder climate like Northern Maine. It was their source of fuel for cooking. Uh, they had inefficient farmhouses that were leaking heat like you wouldn't believe. And they had snow on the ground from November to late April or early May. So it was an incredibly important resource. There was a good market for it. I think it's reasonable to assume this is for firewood. And that makes a difference on the price we compare it to today, so that's why it's important to establish. And I am making a little bit of an assumption here, granted, but like I said, it's a limited analysis anyway. So back in 1920, a landowner could get $2 per cord for firewood. What does that equal in today's money? So now I'm going to unfortunately introduce you to a tool provided by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I would not recommend you visit it. I will leave a link in the description if you want to check it out. I would not recommend it. It's very depressing. What this does is it's an inflation calculator, a cumulative inflation calculator. So you can type in any value for any month and year and then compute it to its real value in a point in time in the future. So what we're going to do is this some stumpage receipt was from August 1920. So we're going to look at $2 in 20, uh, $1920. And we're going to compare it to the most recent stumpage information we have for Aroostook County, Maine. So the most recent stumpage publication we have for Maine uh, is from 2022. It was just released back in January. Maine is a little delayed in releasing these statistics. So I'm not just cherry picking. I'm just going with the most recent data we have. And that's, that's what it is. But it's also a statistic for the entire year. So I'm going to choose June kind of as a halfway mark for the year because it's based on several reports that span the entire time period. So let's look at what that is. We can hit calculate and see that in 2022 dollars, two dollars per cord would be equivalent to $29.19. So that would be $29 per cord paid to the landowner. Now let's see what landowners were actually getting. So like I said, I'm going to be pulling from Maine state statistics. If you want to find statistics for your state, not all states keep them, unfortunately. I, it seems like that should be something they should all do, but they don't. Um, but I have a directory of all potential resources for that. So I'm going to leave a link to that in the description. And you can go to my website and you can just see the best stumpage resources for every state. So let's open up the Maine report from 2022. And we'll scroll down to Aroostook County, which is where Monticello, Maine is. And we can see that we have a section here for firewood. And for all species, the 2022 average was $30 per cord, ranging between $13 and a maximum of $55. So that's pretty cool. Basically, the price has stayed the exact same from 1920 to 2022 in northern Maine. Now, there's probably a fair amount of coincidences there that it is so perfect uh, and I promise you, I didn't cherry pick anything. I tried to do the most honest analysis I could with the most recent data I had, but it was almost perfect. In fact, you know, there's a statistically insignificant increase over time, but that's actually pretty amazing, especially when you consider how much less market there is for firewood. Like I said, I mean, back then you had single pane windows that were leaking out uh, heat like you wouldn't believe. You had fairly large farmhouses um, you had it as your main source of fuel for cooking and everything else. So it's pretty amazing that the price has maintained itself despite the fact that it's kind of now a novelty or luxury. That said, I mean, a lot of people in Northern Maine still heat their homes with firewood, not saying that they don't, but just as a percent of the economy, firewood is just a fraction of what it used to be in terms of significance. But there's so much more to the story than just firewood. And that is because our definition of products has changed over time. Back then, I mean, you gotta, you gotta put yourself in their shoes. You're cutting your firewood with a cross-cut saw, you're loading it onto a sled, and then when the consumer gets it to heat their own home, how are they splitting it? They're splitting it with an ax. What type of wood do you want for that activity? You're gonna want nice, straight wood. So there's actually an interesting entry uh, about this in his journal from during the harvest, which would be January 8th, 1920. This was cut in the winter when it was paid for only in the summer. And he wrote that his work partner, whose name I cannot pronounce, broke the 10th commandment today on account of crooked lumber that would not stay on the sleds. They specifically avoided cutting crooked lumber because it would not stay on the sleds and it would cause a whole lot of issues for them as they tried to transport the wood. 
So long story short, back then, even for low grade products, there was a preference for nice straight lumber. And there's a lot of stuff that they burned back then that today we'd be using for high grade saw timber. So we look at that first initial number of just firewood and say, well, you know, $2.1920 would be the same today. So the timber held its value throughout that entire period. But it's much more powerful than that because a lot of the wood that would have been sold just as firewood as a very low grade product 100 years ago now could be sold as a high grade product. And this isn't unique to, to hardwood. This is something inherent in the advancement of mill technologies and just products and markets overall. So a great example of this would be just the evolution of milling technologies. There's another entry where he's going hunting with his father and he comes across the remains of an old steam powered sawmill in the woods, but it's totally abandoned. And as a young man, he was a little confused because he said that it almost appeared as though you could just start it up and keep working today. Everything was there that needed this mill to function, but it was just sitting there non-functional. And the reason was as soon as gasoline powered sawmills came out, they were so much less expensive to operate, so much easier to work with, um, that it just became incredibly unprofitable for these steam mills to continue operation. They consumed too much energy, they didn't produce, produce enough power. I don't know the exact economics, but clearly when the gas engine became popular in milling technologies, um, the steam engines no longer became profitable and they were, they were just left there. So you imagine the capabilities between those two time periods of running a mill on steam when you have that's incredibly energy intensive, you have to be sawing the, the largest logs, you have to be sawing the best logs. And so when you have a piece of wood like this, you can't saw that profitably into a small piece of lumber. But as the milling becomes more efficient, as you get gas powered engineer, um, excuse me, gas powered engines, and then later you have band saws, which are much thinner, much lighter, they can rotate much faster with less energy, all of a sudden you can cut smaller and smaller logs profitably until you have trees about this size that can be profitably sawn into lumber. So there are way more trees these days that can be sawn into a higher grade product than in 1920, certainly. Like it's not even comparable. And yet one of the most common things you hear in the forest community is that it just ain't what it used to be. Everything was better 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And it's kind of just accepted as gospel truth. And nobody really questions it that much. But when you really look into the data, I'm not talking about just one piece of paper from 1920. If you really look at everything, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of volatility. Mills come and go, um, product classes rise and fall. But if you look at the entirety of the situation, it's not too bad. It really isn't. Things have been remarkably stable. Um, and so it, it's just kind of fascinating to me. And especially when you look at the objective advancements we've made in being able to get higher grade products out of lower grade trees, you have to ask exactly what's going on. Is this just rose colored nostalgia? Is this, you know, older guys looking nostalgically at the days when they first entered the woods industry? Um, no, there's, there's definitely some truth to the fact that things are harder today, but it's not coming from the broader economy and market. It's coming from the forest. Our forests are significantly degraded compared to what they used to be, and this is kind of the double-edged sword of being able to harvest higher grade products from lower grade trees. Suddenly, you don't have to grow trees to as large of a size. You don't have to be as discerning in the species or form of the trees you grow. And there's kind of this idea in forestry that you need lower grade markets to manage the forest. And that's true. Um, but, you know, I, I like to remember kind of the, the concept of Lucifer being a fallen angel. Um, good things can very oftentimes become bad things if the wrong path is taken. And this has come at a very real consequence of it has enabled short-sighted managers uh, to degrade their forests more rapidly. And this is not new. This isn't something that just randomly started in, I don't know, the 1990s. There's actually a funny anecdote from the same journal that I've been pulling from of my great-grandfather meeting up with a lumberjack and the lumberjack was reminiscing about how good things were in the 1880s. He was talking about how big the spruce trees were and how good the hunting was. There were deer just everywhere. And, um, you know, you, you have to take some of that with a grain of salt because there is a tendency to just romanticize the past, of course. 
Um, but I, I think it's, it's a good indication that this has been going on for quite some time and it has followed the process of technological advancement in the forest economy pretty closely. But the good news is we have a lot of control over this. I made a video about how your timber is not a commodity. And basically it was an argument against the tendency for people to act as though the market was this external thing outside of a forest manager's control. And you know, it's a common theme you hear at forestry conferences and stuff where people just wanna hear about the markets or complain about the markets. When in fact, the biggest variable in the success of their management is the quality of their forest and they have almost total control over that and yet it seems like we we tend to forget this and maybe we tend to minimize the overall impact our economic management can have so that's all for now just something for you to consider and i do want to be clear i'm not saying that the forest industry can't fall on hard times i'm not saying there aren't parts of the country where it really is substantially worse than it was 20 years ago certainly it can and there are uh what I really want to draw focus to today though is the extent to which a lot of things have really gotten better and also for the tendency for things to reach equilibrium and be stable over time which has been a theme in some of my more recent videos. So really this is just a reminder to remain focused on the one thing that matters most and that is the soundness of your management and if you are new to forest management and you want to learn more about it you want to manage your forest in a sound way the first step is to reach a basic understanding of some of the principles around forestry. And that's why I wrote How to Read Your Forest. It's a free ebook that you can get uh, by signing up for it. So I'm gonna leave a link in the description in the comments below, and you can get your free copy to peruse at your own leisure. So with that, I will see you later.